Hi there, my name is Christopher Odd. I recently spent five hours playing for Axis Games upcoming release, Marvel's Midnight Suns. And like many of you, I had my hesitations about this new style of gameplay coming from the studio that created XCOM of all things, one of my favorite game series of all time. Well, I've got a lot to cover. Go ahead and utilize the chapters on this video to jump to specific points if you'd like. I'm treating this video as the ultimate deep dive into everything we know about Marvel's Midnight Suns to this point in time. I will say this about my five hour experience with the game. I was happily surprised by many aspects, but I also encountered some less desirable surprises along the way. Let's talk about it. I could not have predicted this outcome, but it is intriguing. So what is this game exactly? Marvel's Midnight Suns is a tactical strategy RPG. And I mean that in the truest sense of the words. In Midnight Suns, we play as the Hunter, the first fully customizable superhero in the Marvel Universe. And as the Hunter, we team up with a multitude of our favorite Marvel superheroes in order to defeat Lilith, the Mother of Demons. More on her later in the video, she's very important. We spend our time going on missions, of course, but we also spend a lot of time at our headquarters called the Abbey. Now, the Abbey acts as our central hub. You want to spend time each day visiting the Forge for upgrades and research, sparring with your new superhero partners, engaging in hangouts with your new buddies, and just exploring the Abbey grounds. The Abbey is absolutely crammed with activities to engage in, some of which are necessary for your overall campaign strategy, some of which just serve to dig deeper into the lore of the Midnight Suns world, which I should mention is a much more supernatural Marvel world than you may be used to unless you're familiar with some Marvel deep cuts. At the event, I was able to meet some hardcore Marvel fans. They were amazing. And they all know this lore inside and out. And to say that they were extremely impressed with the number of references and amount of fan service included would be quite the understatement. If you're somebody with lesser Marvel knowledge, don't worry about it. The game has plenty in the way of journal pages and dialogue to really flush out anything that you're curious to know. So we're going to dive more into different aspects of the Abbey later on, but it bears repeating there's a lot to do here and it's a core element of the RPG aspect of this game. Repeat after me, this is an RPG, this is an RPG, this is an RPG. Any more questions? Let's chat combat now, shall we? After all, that's the meat of the game, right? Or is it? It's got to be stated up front. This is not simply an XCOM game with superheroes. In fact, there's very few combat mechanics that overlap with XCOM at all. And that's the game's benefit, in my opinion. If this is the first you're hearing or seeing anything about Midnight Sun's combat, here's a quick primer. The combat isn't tile-based. There's no percentage to hit, and you won't be sending a legion of dedicated rookies into battles where many of them never return. Think about it. Superheroes, they don't miss. That wouldn't be very super. So how do you implement RNG that we know for Axis loves so much? Well, you do that through card draws, card unlocks, and the occasional percent chance to instant KO an enemy using the environment, which is super fun to do. Later, I'm going to share with you an incredible moment that really drove home the fact that Yes, we're definitely playing a Firaxis game. So if it's not XCOM with superheroes, how does it play? Well, you're using a deck of cards to issue attacks that deal damage, skills that provide supplemental effects that don't typically deal damage directly, and hero moves that are essentially ultimate abilities, generally dealing massive damage. Uh, using the cards that you're dealt, you need to creatively defeat a variety of enemies and fallen superhero bosses. And these battles will take place in a variety of different, what I like to call, arenas. In my time with the game, it seemed like most of Act 1 was taking place in New York City. We're on the rooftops, the streets, warehouses, the underbelly, where the enemy likes to thrive. Uh, we did fight in the Sanctum Sanctorum. And as we progress through the game, there's going to be some other more iconic locations. They hinted at the Quentin Carnival, the Avenger Tower and a few others that Marvel fans are going to appreciate, no doubt. One area that did feel familiar to XCOM is the mission objectives that I encountered. We'd rescue VIPs or civilians, blow up a helicopter before it takes off, AKA before the turn timer ticks to zero, or we had to get a vault that the enemies were protecting, 
and we had to defeat them to then get the objective. As you'd expect, while you're trying to deal with these different objectives, you also have waves of enemies coming in every turn. So you have to balance your priorities in order to be successful. I did initially have my reservations about the card base system that we saw in the launch trailer. But after playing it for myself, many of my hesitations were not only quelled, but skewed in the quite opposite direction. Simply put, the combat was very satisfying, very challenging, and I left the event wanting to play more. To get a bit more detailed, each mission sees you entering combat with three superheroes. Now, some missions will have required superheroes, but most of the time, you're free to choose who's going to accompany the hunter on main missions. Side missions, however, or general missions as they're called in this game, are led by heroes other than the hunter, and while you can bring the hunter on these, they're not required. Your deck is comprised of cards that belong to each of the characters that you brought along. And I enjoyed that there's almost no attack for X amount of damage cards that we see in a lot of other card games. The vast majority of cards here have abilities that are either unique to the hero or other mechanics allowing you to chain card plays together in a way that really satisfies the puzzle solvers out there. We'll get into more of these mechanics later in the video, as well as take a closer look at each of the heroes that I was able to play and go into some of their specific abilities as well. Speaking of puzzles though, that's really how the combat feels in my opinion. Each turn you're analyzing which enemies are on the battlefield, you can see the enemy intents and try to plan accordingly. The only RNG at play here is which cards you draw from your deck, but once you come up with a plan, you're gonna be able to execute it. Now the start of a turn sees you drawing new cards from your deck and then you're allowed three card plays, two redraws, and one hero move in any order or combination that you want. Every time you play an attack or a skill card, you're generating heroism. Heroism is used for the more powerful cards and interacting with environmental objects. Now bonus strategy tip here, use the heroism often. You can use them on environmental objects and it doesn't cost a card play. So while you may think that you're out of options, look to use the environment as often as you can. There's a constant push and pull system here to build heroism and then spend it, which I really enjoyed as part of the overall puzzle solving. And when you do play your heroism cards, which you're gonna get to do often, you're rewarded with big damage, a really cool cinematic, and just a feeling that fills you with a sense of badassery. I do wanna to touch on the move ability quickly here because I feel like it's incredibly well thought out and the implementation is very clean. First, you can only move one hero per turn. Strategically, that has some pretty major implications. The rest of your movement is decided on what angle your attacks are coming from, and you'll notice a green circle on the ground indicating where your hero is going to land after they perform an attack. Second, when you're looking at moving, you can see all possible interactions with the environment to get a clear understanding of what moves you can execute and who you'll be able to hit if you move to that location. And third, if you're unhappy with your move, that's okay. You can continue moving that hero as much as you like until you play another card. This avoids a lot of potential headaches where your move doesn't quite give you the positioning that you thought it might without having an undo button. Before I get into breaking down individual heroes and all of their abilities that I got to experience, I just want to talk about a couple of basic card mechanics. One that you're going to see all the time is a mechanic called Quick. If you KO an enemy with a Quick card, you get your card play refunded. This is especially useful to use on enemy minions who don't have an actual health bar. Instead, they die when taking any damage at all. Of course, you can use a Quick card to KO a larger unit that you've whittled down. That will also work. Most heroes also have some form of knockback, which is used to move enemies around the arena, both taking and dealing damage when hitting either each other or environmental objects. And then there's like a forceful knockback variant, which allows you to fling enemies super far. It all plays together really well and is really fun to use. Now, each of the superhero's abilities revolves around their comic book theme. Some heroes are going to have deeper mechanics than others, 
For example, some have different meters that you might want to build during combat that will unleash very powerful special abilities, and some are a little bit more straightforward. I'm going to dive into each of the heroes I was able to see at the event, but since this was only the first five hours of the game, we're quite literally only scratching the surface of what each superhero will be capable of once further developed. Now, besides being alphabetically first in the list of playable superheroes, I'm going to start with one of my personal faves, Blade. Guess that makes two of us. As an aside, Blade was unknowingly one of my first introductions to the Marvel Universe, thanks to the movies from the late 90s, early 2000s. Definitely recommend watching the trilogy if you haven't. Wesley Snipes is quintessential Blade, in my opinion. Anyways, Blade has Chain, Bleed, and Lifesteal cards early on. Chain lets you hit multiple targets with the same target multiple times. Bleed applies a damage over time, which will ignore things like block and resist. And Lifesteal works exactly how you'd imagine it does. Heal for the same amount of damage that you inflict. He is a vampire after all. It's surprised they all still have their heads. Let's move next to Captain Marvel. Captain Marvel has taunts, blocks, she does damage in a long line, and she has a special ability called Binary. Taunt works like you imagine. If you see an enemy targeting one of your allies that you're not happy with, use one of Captain Marvel's taunt attacks to draw their attention towards her. A block is going to reduce incoming damage. And after playing three Captain Marvel cards, she's going to draw the Go Binary card. Playing this increases your damage by 100% as long as you have block remaining. Getting to this binary status is crucial to Captain Marvel being worth having in the party. It's easy to get there, and when you do, she's just dealing massive, massive amounts of damage. As we continue through this list, uh, start thinking about some potential hero combinations that you think would go well together, and let me know what you come up with in the comments. I'd be happy to talk about this, because it's one of the things that we theory crafted a lot on the bus ride home after the event. Another hero that I just fell in love with playing at the event was Ghost Rider. Ghost Rider has this really cool ability to open up a giant hole in the ground. And when you attempt to knock an enemy into these holes, there's a percentage chance to instantly knock them out. Uh, one of his heroic cards, Hellride, is a personal favorite of mine. Just watch this, here's why. Yeah, it's sick. Ghost Rider also builds up a souls meter by knocking out enemies. Each time he fills it, he's going to draw a copy of his Drain Souls card, which chains, life steals, and then busts other Drain Souls cards. You can already see the combinations with him. He's also he's just one of the more badass characters. Damn, you're good. How could you tell? Oh, and earlier I mentioned a special moment that really confirmed to me that this was a game made by the developers of XCOM. Yeah, check this out. 79% chance to instant KO. Failed twice. Classic. You can really tell that Magic is Jake Solomon's favorite hero because she has a really unique kit. Uh, her Limbo Portal ability is brilliant and incredibly fun to set up and use. Basically, you set up a portal with consideration for where the enemy is going to come flying out of it, or maybe more specifically with consideration for what you want the enemy to fly into when leaving the portal. Then, instead of simply knocking an enemy backwards, the next knockback card that Magic uses knocks the enemy through the portal instead. She also has a Gather card, which serves to damage enemies and move them towards the center of the cast point. Lots of enemy control on Magic. She is going to be someone you want to combo with somebody that does a lot of AoE damage. Gather them up. Boom. For big damage. Bob's your uncle. Next up, let's talk Spider-Man! 
he was just announced as being in the game. One thing that hit home while playing him is just how good of a job Fraxus has done with giving each superhero their own movement style in combat. Obviously, Spider-Man swings all the time, and it's awesome. As you may guess, he gets chain attacks, but he also has an ability called Thwip, which binds an enemy in place and makes him unable to act. This is important because there is stun in this game, typically implemented when launching somebody into an outdoor power unit. But when an enemy is stunned, they'll awaken after taking damage. However, with Bind and Thwip, you can still damage this enemy and they're still going to be unable to act. Very, very powerful. He also has a Spider Sense card early on that's going to grant you some card draw and one fast, it's called. Fast essentially reduces the cost of heroic cards by one. You're probably sick of hearing this by now, but he's a blast to play as well. You can feel the embodiment of the characters as you know them from the comic books and movies, just in the way they move around the battlefield. It's just chef's kiss. Sometimes I even impress myself. Now, I know you've been waiting for this guy. He's a fan favorite after all. Let's talk Tony Stark, AKA Iron Man, AKA Robo Man. Now one of Stark's cards is called Surgical Strike. And by playing into his ego a little bit, he gets to chain more enemy attacks based on how many other Iron Man cards you have in your hand. He can also apply Marked, which refunds card plays after killing a marked target, and Vulnerable, which increases the damage enemies take. Again, because he's the only guy that matters, a lot of his cards gain additional abilities when they're redrawn. Now, obviously, I'm, I'm just picking on him. I'm pretty confident that he can handle it. Dr. Stephen Strange, he operates as you would imagine. He focuses more on debuffs, buffs, encouraging card draws, additional card plays. And some of his cards can be enhanced by using extra heroism. One of his early cards is called the Blessing of Vishanti, and that gives all of the attack cards in your hand plus six damage until the attack gets played or discarded. Using this at the right time, and specifically with the right other hero combinations, is a huge bonus. Solid transition incoming. Ever play Russian Roulette before? Wouldn't advise it, but someone like Nico would probably love it. Her staff of one is a little unpredictable, and many of her abilities have random effects. These effects are determined when the ability card is drawn. So she's got things like stun, weak, vulnerable, mark target, counter, fast, strengthen, blood magic, more damage, you name it. I'll put something on the screen to cover off what each of these mechanics do. Here. Are you looking? It's on the screen right now. You see it? Yeah, there you go, good. One of her stronger abilities though is called Empower. And this brings the cost of all heroic cards in your hand to zero for that turn. Again, the possibilities of combining her with heroes that have strong heroic cards is really impressive. And uh, she brings a little bit more of that RNG to this game that you may be missing because so far, most things are easy to implement, and once you have a plan, you do it. For her, at least you know what abilities on that card when it's drawn, but anything can happen. And don't worry, I didn't forget about our own superhero, the Hunter, obviously. At the start of the game, the Hunter has forceful knockback heroic cards and some very strong heal cards. But the Hunter eventually gets access to light abilities, dark abilities, and power abilities. Light abilities focus on support via healing and generating heroism. Dark abilities focus on damage and enemy control. While the power branch tries to kind of straddle this line between both. The Hunter is also going to gain access to callers over the course of the game. Each caller has a powerful ability that's going to trigger if the hunter plays abilities of a certain type. For example, play three light cards, or play a light, dark, and power card in any order. We weren't able to reach callers in our time at the event, uh, so you're just going to have to take my word for it. 
actually, you don't have to take my word for it. I'll just show you the in-game tutorial, and there you go. The Hunter also gets access to suits that are going to have passive abilities, and for the more fashion-inclined, what I really appreciate is that once you unlock these suits and abilities, you can move the passives between suits so that you can have a look that you like with the passives that you want. Let's talk enemies now for a bit. Uh, enemy variety started to increase after my first couple hours with Midnight Suns. Initially, the elite enemies were mostly just tankier, but later on, enemy abilities actually became way more challenging to deal with. One of the more intriguing enemy mechanics that I'll highlight here is called Frenzy. And when an enemy is frenzied, instead of politely waiting for your team to finish up before giving them the go-ahead, they're going to attack after a certain number of your actions, indicated by the counter near their health bar. This totally changes the fight because previously you could do whatever you wanted on your turn and then pass it over. But... When they're frenzied, you got to consider each of your plays very carefully, with much more care, much more nuance. There's also boss fights against fallen versions of some superheroes that you might be familiar with. I had the opportunity to face off against fallen Venom, and these fights make for some of the more engaging and rewarding of the bunch. I particularly enjoyed when Venom would target our group, but if we use clever repositioning, we could turn the tables and not just avoid the incoming attack, but place enemies within and they would take damage instead. Think about some of the previous heroes that we discussed and start to think about some of the repositioning that's available and how to utilize that. Oh, these battles are absolutely enjoyable. It's not over yet, but it will be if this keeps up. I hope I've demonstrated to you that overall I found the combat to be not only pleasurable, but something that I really left the event wanting more of. The way that combat sequences presented themselves as puzzles I needed to solve really hooked me. Now, since I only played the early part of the game, I have to imagine that it gets even crazier later on when you have multiple enemy abilities triggering all the time. I'm looking forward to seeing the more powerful enemy versions and the different types of abilities that we're gonna get access to to address those abilities. And while I do feel that they really nailed the combat here, there's one small thing that just annoys the heck out of me. Yeah. That happens after every kill. It gets old really quick, in my opinion. I don't know if that's an option that you could turn off. I don't mind it once in a while. Perhaps Marvel really wanted to lean into the, hey, we aren't actually killing people thing. But a little less frequent on the knockout callouts would be... <laughs> I would love that. Thanks. We are eternal! So remember way back when, when I said Marvel's Midnight Suns is a tactical strategy RPG, and I mean that in the truest sense of the words? Well, this is where I get to expand on that. So when you're not out KOing enemies, you're spending time with your new pals at the Abbey. And at least in the first five hours of the game, you're doing that a lot. It's worth stating here that some people are really going to enjoy this, and some people are going to find it to be quite slow. I'll share what camp I'm in later on. Before I get into all the activities that we'll be busy with at the Abbey, though, it's important to kind of know how we got there and why we're doing this. So I mentioned Lilith earlier, and she's the key antagonist that's responsible for an unlikely team-up between our Avenger buddies, the Midnight Suns, and everybody else. So who is Lilith really? Well, Lilith is an immortal who's been revived by a group named Hydra under the leadership of Dr. Faustus. He's a psychopath. How are they doing this? They're using something called the Darkhold. The Darkhold's a book which grants people anything they desire at the cost of their souls. So as you can imagine, the last people who should get their hands on this is a subversive military organization determined to establish a fascist worldwide government. But here we are. Lilith has been in a quote-unquote eternal slumber for about 300 years. Who put her in that slumber, you may ask? I'll give you one guess. 
In terms of power, Lilith is on par with the ultimate baddies that you might be familiar with, like Thanos, Apocalypse, Doom. She's probably even worse. There's a cosmic event called the Midnight Sun that's approaching. And as it does, she's getting stronger still. Lilith can corrupt anyone, regardless of how powerful they are. The only person capable of stopping her is the Hunter. Why is that? As we learned in the early trailers, Lilith is our mother. Yeah, it's going to be messy. You remind me of my own beloved. Now, due to her supernatural nature, the Avengers get in touch with the Midnight Suns, who have more experience dealing with such a thing. And this is the start of many beautiful friendships filled with all the Marvel charm and quick-witted, sarcastic quips that you would expect. In fact, instead of listening to me tell you in my own words, I'm just going to share with you some of the opening cutscenes that set things up really nicely. This is also going to be a good opportunity to hear the in-game sound and voice acting a bit more. Don't go anywhere. You're going to want to see this. I'll talk to you in a couple of minutes. Okay. You did that one on purpose. The fabric of magic is unwinding. We are fortunate to be here at all. And where is here, exactly? Salem, Massachusetts. Well, a pocket dimension in Salem, Massachusetts. Oh, suburbs. Nice. Welcome to the Abbey. Home of the Midnight Sun. What the hell is this? Lilith's Junior Demon League? Wait, it's that jerk from TV. Which one? Now, if everyone would just take a moment... Enough! You're standing on my flowers. Oh, been a long time, Sarah. It's caretaker now. If I could have avoided this moment, I would, but... Oh, spare me the speech. I know Lilith's back. We are sisters after all. <sighs> Guess we're suddenly invisible now. Shall we chat, Stephen? No one can argue that the Hunter earned their rest in the first battle against Lilith. I only hope they are up for the task once more. You wizards always make everything sound so lofty. I raised my sister's only child as a weapon against her. And saved the world in the process. Now you want me to dig them up and ask them to do it again. I did not write the prophecy, Sarah. Besides, I am no common grave robber. We are simply reuniting their ethereal essence with their corporal form. Speaking of, it would help to have a mental image for the procedure. Spare no detail. Spiritual identity theft is no laughing matter. So this takes us pretty nicely into the character customization available for your hunter. I'd suggest spending as much time as you like here because you're going to be looking at your hunter a lot. Like, a lot, a lot. You're going to be spending a resource called Gloss on custom looks, uh, customizing your bedroom, replacing paintings in the abbey, to really just make this feel like a new home that you actually want to be in. As if the gym and video games and swimming area wouldn't already do that for you. But speaking of Gloss, you're going to find this randomly around the abbey. You're also going to get as mission rewards depending on performance. In addition to Gloss, you're also going to find journal pages, tarot cards, essences for upgrading cards, arcane knowledge, masterworks painting, gifts for your friends, and most importantly, you're going to find love. No, I'm just kidding. Sort of. You're going to find friendships. Friendships are a core component of Marvel's Midnight Suns, and you're going to be reminded of it often. Certain interactions with your newfound friends are going to either increase or decrease your friendship rating with them. There are plenty of amazing things to do around the Abbey. I'm all for spending hours getting to know my companions. But there was something about the friendship system that just felt a little bit flat for me. See, 
the higher the friendship rating with other superheroes, the more powerful combat bonuses you get when they're fighting with you. And while that's fine on the surface, it does sort of detract from one of the key aspects of RPGs for me. We're often presented with numerous responses to our friends' comments, but because of the friendship system, I always found myself wanting to pick the right one instead of engaging in conversations a bit more naturally. This could just be because of my limited time with the game, and maybe this opinion will change at full release. I hope it does. But I don't see any real incentive to choose some of the more questionable responses at the risk of hurting my friendship rating. Tell me, does that mean you are half-loved? Huh. <laughs> she didn't describe you as a snarky jackass, but here we are. All right, Tony Stark Jr., ask your questions. I did hear that superheroes would react to my choices differently depending on their personality types, but in my hands-on time with the game, a positive reply equaled positive friendship, and sarcasm was a bit of a risk. I'd love to see a sort of rivalry side of the friendship meter where I could still gain some of these combat bonuses with somebody that I've maybe pissed off at some point or another. But for now, that doesn't seem to be the case. I will give them props in the writing department, though. There's a lot of character disposition. The conversations are very Marvel in nature. Lots of jokes, lots of sarcasm. You see, this is why you shouldn't eat spicy food, Bruce. And most of it actually lands, too. When it doesn't, it's not, like, offensively bad, which is pretty hard to achieve. I'd say the best comparison is the recent Guardians of the Galaxy game in terms of humor. And if you're not up to speed on all the Marvel lore, especially that of the Midnight Suns, I really suggest spending a lot of time chatting with your buddies because it's a fantastic way to just get you up to speed on that stuff. Now, in addition to conversational choices to build friendships, you can also engage in what's called hangouts. Hangouts, for those of us, I know, we never go outside. What's a hangout? They're special interactions that dramatically boost your relationships, and they can give you cosmetic unlocks as well. If you've found any gifts in your time at the Abbey, you can give them to your friends during these hangouts for additional friendship points. I do dig the fact that the gift system seems to reward you for giving appropriately matched gifts to a friend that you think would like it the most. So you're supposed to use what you know of your friends to decide who should get which gift. In my hands-on, I only got to give one gift away, so I can't really comment on how effective that system is. There is another layer to this too though, the light and dark path system that I alluded to when we were talking about our hunter skills earlier. Unlike the friendship system that hides its results behind dialogue choices anonymously, light and dark options are shown clearly in dialogue. What's cool here is that you can impact your alignment based on more than just dialogue, so playing certain cards in combat will also move you further towards the light or the dark side. We didn't get to experience much of this in the five hours of hands-on either, but it's yet another mechanic at play here that's going to make your hunter in your playthrough feel unique compared to that of your friends or something to do differently on future playthroughs. All of this said, personally, I'll be spending as much time as possible with my new buds at release because... To me, the background Marvel knowledge that I can gain, the connections that I can build with these characters and combat bonuses I get, they're going to outweigh that kind of lack of perceived choice that I referenced. As I said, I'm sure it can help us. I just need to convince Tony to set his ego aside. So imagine this. You've come back from a hard combat mission. You've buffed as many friendships as you can through conversation. What else can you do? Well, hold on to your butts because we're just getting started. Now, the Abbey works on a daily cycle. Each day, you probably want to visit Doctor Strange and Iron Man in the Forge, spar with one of your buddies under the direction of Blade. Maybe you want to customize your room or dig out some old faves from your closet. Maybe you just want to explore the Abbey grounds. The Abbey grounds are surprisingly massive, by the way. After you do all of this stuff, visit the mirror table to select your next combat mission. So let's walk through each of these in a little bit more detail so you can kind of understand what that day is going to look like as a whole. 
let's start with the forge you're going to be coming in here all the time and much to my surprise there is actual work that gets done here but it does sort of take a back seat to the banter between dr steven and tony i enjoyed my time here because these guys are a pretty good comedy duo and once you can convince them that we need to get actual work done you'll notice that they have pretty different jobs so big tony is responsible for analyzing gamma coils that you get as rewards for combat missions after analysis is complete you're going to be presented with three cards to choose from and add to your deck this is the core deck building component of the game you can only choose one of the three so choose wisely if you're lucky enough or i guess unlucky enough depending on what you're aiming for to get a duplicate of a card you already have then you can take it to blade to modify them but before we talk about blade we can't forget to give dr strange a spot in the limelight now he's critically important to your overall strategy think tygen from xcom dr strange studies artifacts that you found and handles the research department at the abbey uh, artifacts are going to unlock additional research projects at the forge and generate resources for use in ability upgrades and crafting and since Doctor Strange is such a fast worker, research projects only take one day to complete. Uh, some of these are important things like combat items, and some of them are really important things like room upgrades and hero outfits. Starting to smell in here. Let's go meet Blade in the yard. Blade is the yard manager. It has a couple of roles. First, Blade is going to use your duplicates to create a more powerful version of those duplicate cards. Increase damage? Sure. Reduce heroism cost? Sure. Brand new mechanic to fundamentally change how powerful the card is? Absolutely. Multiple things at once can be and often are changed here. So you're going to want to check back often to see what combining your cards can do. Earlier, I mentioned that you'd find different essences around the Abbey. And this is where you're going to use those. In addition to the duplicate cards, you also need to spend essence depending on the card type that you're upgrading. So exploring the Abbey does have some gameplay implications here as well so in addition to upgrading your cards blade also happens to be your sparring coach each day you're going to want to come and visit your favorite vampire and ask him to teach you how to suck some blood he'd probably love that that's a lie he will not like that blade is sassy a little bit cranky i still love him though he gets a pass if you do give him a small amount of nondescript credits He'll happily guide you through a sparring session with a hero friend of your choice. You do want to choose carefully here. You can only spar with a given hero once every four days. As you'd expect, this is going to give you a friendship boost. But you'll also get a combat bonus with that hero if they join you on a mission that day. So it's generally a good idea to plan ahead and know who you're planning to take out. To commemorate the sparring session, you're going to leave with a poster that you can customize. And if you'd like, you can put these into empty frames around the Abbey to just spruce up the place. To be honest, I would have appreciated a small cinematic of the actual sparring, at least for the first session between the hunter and your chosen hero friend. But for now, hunter. I'll just accept the poster. It's fine. I think the custom Ghost Rider poster is going to look sick on my wall at the end of my bed. Yeah, that's where it's going to go. I did mention trials previously as well. If you're of a high enough level, definitely do these as soon as they're available. You've got your pal Charlie, and the trials seem to unlock abilities that grant access to new areas of the Abbey grounds. Side note, I completed this trial in two turns, which I thought was pretty impressive. But I only got a mission rating of two stars. Ego crushed. The first trial unlocked the word of power spell called open and it is an app description so i'm not really complaining there do appear to be three other words of power so i'm excited to see what else we're going to get in the full release no doubt those are going to unlock other areas of the abbey that i can access and explore further and you do absolutely owe it to yourself to set aside some time each day to explore the abbey grounds at the start of our journey, I was resurrected and I walked out of my tomb for the first time. As soon as I got control, I checked behind the tomb. Because video games. Always check behind and always check under the stairs. What did I find there? I got a rare arcane chest that I couldn't open. And it wasn't until near the end of my five hours of hands-on time with the game that I was able to actually open a chest. Sure, I'd found others, but this one was... 
This one was rare. So it was in the back of my mind from the very start of our session. Now, one thing I really did appreciate was how the in-game map adds these chests. So you don't have to go scrambling later on to remember where they were. Now, these re-chests will also reseal periodically. And you should revisit them from time to time. The higher your arcane level, the more rewards each arcane chest will have. What's your arcane level? It's the first I'm mentioning it. Don't worry. It is another thing that you got to keep track of. But you're going to get arcane points for doing pretty much anything at the Abbey. If you're investigating a book or a picture or a grave. If you're exploring, you're going to get a ton of arcane knowledge. Keep exploring and you're also going to find havens. Havens are special moments and special spots where you can spend some special time with your special friends for huge special friendship points. But there's a catch. Each haven can only be used once. And each hero can only attend a single haven over the course of the entire game. Now, I can't comment on the long-lasting implications of this, but due to how limiting it is, it's obviously pretty important. A good last stop here is going to be at Captain Marvel's desk in the War Room. She's going to decrypt any intel caches that you might have, which are going to unlock hero ops. These ops are going to grant powerful hero-specific rewards. But keep in mind that heroes on these ops will be unavailable for combat missions until the following day. This might sound like a lot to do on the daily. And I will say in my first five hours with the game, it did feel like that from time to time. I felt, okay, I, I just, I want to be in combat a lot more frequently. I think due to the nature of the event being time constrained, I found myself skipping a lot of dialogue so I could get to this fallen venom boss fight at the end. And I feel like some people are not going to enjoy this ramp up time with the game. If you just want action, action, action. But you're in charge ultimately of how much exploring that you're doing. So just because I'm one that will go a little bit further in detail doesn't mean that you have to enjoy the game however you want to. One area that I obviously wish I could have spent more time with is the actual deck building component of the game. Due to the limited amount of hands-on time, due to the uh, amount of characters I wanted to experiment with, I wasn't able to gather a whole bunch of duplicate cards, a whole bunch of new cards that would enable me to really get into building a deck out and experimenting with that. I don't think anybody was able to accomplish it. So that's one area that I wish I could have more information on for you, but hopefully we'll get some more access before release and I can share that with you on the channel. So if you're not already subscribed, now would be a good time. Uh, if you guys enjoyed this video as well, please drop a like. That helps a lot. So let's move on to some closing notes here. I hope I was able to demonstrate the things that I feel they really nailed and some of the things that I think that they've missed or hopefully they could even implement some changes to before releasing the full game. That said, I am excited for this, man. This is a unique take on a card game that implements so many different mechanics to feel like, like it's not even cards. I'm basically issuing orders. It's just that those orders are dependent on what I draw. And I think for a game that didn't want to rely on a ton of RNG, that is the perfect way to do it. So combat felt super fulfilling to me. The weakest point for me was some of the dialogue options and how they related to building character relationships. As I said, I do hope that my opinion changes on that with more time in the game. But as it stands in my five hours of hands-on, that was by far the weakest area for me. Not the actual dialogue. That was fine. Just the way that the friendship system encouraged me to only pick options that I felt would boost my friendship. Because sometimes I wanted to know things that I felt would maybe be a more negative answer. And I wouldn't go down that path for fear of hurting the friendship. Now, we also know that there's going to be 13 playable heroes. So far, we've got Iron Man, Captain America, Wolverine, Doctor Strange, Captain Marvel, Blade, Ghost Rider, Magic, Nico Minoru, the Hunter, of course, 
We've since learned, due to today's trailer that was released, that Spider-Man's in there. I've got some gameplay here showing that. Wanda the Scarlet Witch is in there. Very cool. But that leaves one slot, to my count, that's unaccounted for. I'm not playing around. I have no clue who that's going to be. If you guys think you have a guess, or you think some superhero would be perfect for that 13th slot, I want to hear your best guess and justify to me why you think that would fit, or that they would fit, in the Midnight Suns universe. I will say as well, for somebody that enjoys Marvel, but I'm not a hardcore fanboy, and I don't say that as a derogatory term, I admire that people are super into this world. I'm pumped about the supernatural aspect. That to me is an entry point into this world that I feel is a bit more unique. And I feel like they can go a bit of a darker route with things that's more in line with my personal preferences for media. To wrap this all up, I thought that I would share a couple of did you knows. Things that maybe didn't fit nicely in other spots of the video, but I wanted to convey because they were fun or neat or fun or neat will do. So let's get into a couple of did you knows. Imagine this is the post credit scene of your favorite Marvel movie. Here we go. Did you know that cards have a chance to become critical hits? How does that happen? Let me tell you. Each hero actually has different stat ratings. One of those is the critical chance stat. The higher the critical chance, the higher the chance that the card that you draw will become critical. There's a critical damage stat that affects the crit damage of that card. I feel like this is a really cool way to pay homage to games that Firaxis have previously made, like XCOM, where you have critical chance to hit. Very smart implementation, not something that I've seen done before. Love it. Did you know that you seem to gain XP for your heroes based on individual card plays? I realized this when I was healing somebody before ending a mission and I leveled up after I did that. So if you have extra cards to play before you're going to end your battle, play as many as you can because I think you can buff your XP that way. And lastly, most importantly, You've seen Charlie in this video a couple of times. He's our friendly neighborhood puppy dog. The biggest question that needs to be answered. Can you pet the dog? Good girl, Charlie. Thank you for watching, everybody. We'll see you on October 7th for the full release of Midnight Suns. I will no doubt be able to share some additional information between now and then. So again, if you're not subscribed, this would be the perfect time to do so. I will get you up to date as soon as I'm able. Thank you so much for watching, guys. Have a good one. Take care. We'll see you soon.